Welcome to Digital Marketing Solutions, the only podcast hosted by a marketing and startup consultant with over 20 years experience working for ad agencies across the world. Start getting the results you want with online marketing today. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. Okay. Hi, James. Thank you so much for joining me in this podcast episode of Digital Marketing Solutions. Hello to listeners and viewers. Uh, this is another episode, Digital Marketing Solutions. My guest today is James Corr, C-O-R-R. -R. James, can you please, let's get started with an introduction as far as, you know, who you are, your background and your professional um, experience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, James Core, is, as I mentioned, um, I work at a digital marketing agency uh, called Seer Interactive. Uh, my official title there is a senior analytics team lead. And essentially what I've spent the last six years at Seer doing uh, is helping clients develop solutions for web measurement. Um, a lot of that time is spent in things like Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager, um, but it doesn't stop there. There's a lot of Adobe Analytics, uh, Google Data Studio, uh, and a lot of other products. Uh, but essentially, we help clients um, determine what's important to track, why to track that, and align that with their business goals and objectives, and then help them put it into play, implement it, um, QA it, make sure it's working well, and then help them make decisions based off of it, basically. That's kind of the full gamut um, at a high level. That, that's what we do at SEER, and that's, that's what me and my team do at SEER specifically. Now, how did you get started working for, for them? How did you get this experience and knowledge? Because this is something that usually takes several years for you to learn how to use so many different tools, the different processes and procedures involved. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I mean... <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it didn't happen overnight, right? That, that's for sure. Yeah, there's um, no way it could. Yeah. Um, so if we, we kind of rewind uh, my, my career a little bit here, I, like I mentioned, I'm now a team lead and I kind of oversee um, account managers, associates, analysts, developers, data scientists, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm less in the day-to-day -day now. Um, I'm more in the strategic side and, and at a little bit higher level. Um, but if we rewind a couple of years, uh, my progression at Sierra started out as, as what we call an associate, which we can just really think about as an analyst. Okay. Um, an analyst. So in that role, that's really where I picked up uh, a lot of my experience. I, I frankly, I didn't have any web experience or any measurement experience coming into the role. Um, I happened to know somebody that worked at Sierra at the time. Um, I sat down and had coffee with him and told him what I was looking for in, in the next step of my career and, and where I was kind of at. Um, and from there, he said, yeah, it might be something that, that Sears interested in. You should come look at our jobs and, and maybe do an interview here. Uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up um, getting the job. Um, the one thing I did immediately go out and do upon his recommendation that I think helped me at least have some sort of understanding and, and foot in the door, so to speak, um, is what's called the Google Analytics Individually Qualified, mm -hmm. or the GAIQ. It sounds like you've heard of it. Yes, um, I have. I have a Google Analytics uh, certificate up there on the bulletin board. It, it wasn't fun, but um, the knowledge is good. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of brings me to another topic is when you work with business owners, I mean, you've got You've got freelancers, business owners, you've got agencies. You probably want to interact to at least some degree with all of those different audiences. How do you work differently with those types of audiences? That's part one. And my uh, part two to that, I guess, would be, you know, what, what can they do to get more ROI? So the first question that you asked, um, so as Sear, as an agency, as a consultancy, we, we work with a lot of clients, right? So that's, that's the businesses that you talked about, right? Um, we tend to work with some, some uh, freelancers or contractors sometimes to facilitate some work when there's a need, but um, I wouldn't say that we work 
super often with contractors on the SEER side. It's common for us to work with a client who works with a contractor of some sort, a freelancer of some sort. That's absolutely common um, for sure. But I, I, I think in the way that SEER operates, we don't have a ton of freelancer contractors on our staff that we work with. Um, we do a little bit, like I said, but not a ton. But there's absolutely different value that you can get out of, out of the three kind of quote unquote categories, right? So um, the way I like to depict it, um, the value, the reason that an agency uh, brings a lot of value to the table is because an agency works with, they do a few things, generally speaking, really well. That's what SEER does. Um, mm -hmm. We're more of a boutique agency. So we do a few things really well. We focus on that. There are the opposite end of the spectrum turnkey where you do a lot of things, um, which is a different story. But agencies get to experience client problems time and time again across the board for a lot of different clients. So I, I've seen a lot of different problems solved in various ways across a lot of different clients, essentially. So um, I'm very focused in on measurement, right? And, and how we connect that to your business. And I see that just in a myriad of ways mm -hmm. um, across the board. So I've literally worked on hundreds of different implementations um, and, you know, worked across dozens of different, you know, CMOs to, you um, account managers to marketing managers, you name it at, you know, at varying levels. Um, so we have different experiences. We see a lot of different um, experiences and things across the board. So that makes agencies really well equipped to handle varied challenges that our clients often run into. Um, the other thing that I think agencies are really good about um, that, that is super valuable to our clients is that we have a, a deep expertise in that specific field, right? So I have a team of people that focus on and work primarily in measurement um, all day, every day, right? So you can absolutely, you know, if you're, let's say a Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, you absolutely can afford to have somebody just dedicated on your staff, but not everybody is that fortunate, right? So, um, and even when you have somebody dedicated on your staff to, let's say a certain discipline, um, they're gonna be looking at it from the lens of, of your business and, and just your solutions and what you have at their fingertips. Whereas my team gets to collaborate, see different solutions from each other, um, as well as across different clients and things like that. So I think that's that's a big reason why agencies bring value to the table. Um, we can scale up and scale down depending upon you know what agency you're talking to. So uh, that's the agency piece. Let me pause there. Any anything that you wanted to else tack onto that or? Well, I, I mean, obviously there, there's very very different markets. Mm -hmm. I mean, given what you do and what you see every day, I mean, you probably see wide disparities when you're working, when you see freelancers, you interact with freelancers online, small business owners. Um, you know, from time to time, I'll, I'll offer to help uh, nonprofit organizations, I'll get involved with them. 99.9% .9 of the time, for whatever reason, everybody's working part-time or they're volunteer part-time. So it's not at all uncommon to see nonprofit websites that have no SEO or outdated mm -hmm. design. They want to measure, but they don't know what to measure. And freelancers, for the most part, seem to be more of template installers, and then they go on to the next quick flip. How do you how do you work with the small business owner to help them determine what success would be like for them before you can determine any kind of KPIs? Mm -hmm. And then there's all the unpacking with all of these other, the different groups. Yeah, great question. Um, and that's one thing that we focus on a lot at SEER uh, is like the value that we drive and, and how do we get there? and. and what does that mean to a client? Um, it can mean different things to different people, of course, right? But from the perspective of small businesses and, and how do you even get to that, like let's call it, it you know, square one, um, I'd, fo I'd say focus on the bottom line and what the closest thing is to that bottom line. So for a lead gen business, that's somebody submitting a lead of some sort, right? Um, I'd also say for the small business owner out there, don't overcomplicate it, don't overthink it, right? There is quite literally, when I say you can measure anything on a website or within an app, I, I literally mean that. So I mean, like I have clients where we have implemented things that um, 
track your, you know, how many tabs you have open of their website. Let me be very clear. We're just talking about on your client's website. So like mysite.com, how many tabs you have open of that. Mm -hmm. I don't, or I'm not talking about like quote unquote black hat measurement across sites. That's, that's not what we do. And that's often not what our industry does, but sometimes get portrayed in that light. Um, having said that, uh, I think there, you could literally track anything from the, you know, you could track highlighting text on your page. If you wanted to, you can track scroll depth, how often somebody gets to the bottom of the page, which are, or that's a great thing to track in, in some circumstances. Uh, point being though, don't overthink it. Um, so for a lot of small businesses out there that have a relatively simple website, you probably have some idea or indication of that, that leading metric that's going to lead to your revenue or bottom line. It may be the um, button to click to call. It may be a form submission. Um, it could be a transaction. Um, so depends on what industry and if you're selling stuff directly, um, the, the, the platform that you're on, something like a Shopify, um, often has analytics built in. It also generally affords you the uh, ability to integrate Google Analytics as well, which we, again, I said, we kind of specialize in that and do a lot of Google Analytics stuff. So we always probably go there and, and see a lot of value out of that. But just, just getting that Google Analytics set up and started and figuring out how to track that one or two things will get you 80% of the value, 90% of the value that I think a small business owner really needs from their measurement. Given your interactive, what you do, to what extent or how important would you say um, it is to screen and then onboard? And how, how, I mean, do you participate in that? To screen and onboard as far as like the sales and uh, business development process and onboarding new clients, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yep. Great question. So I am absolutely involved in a lot of sales discussions and business development discussions. Um, I do a lot of that. Um, and it really revolves around trying to understand our clients' problems and then understanding, A, if we can even help them, and, and right. B, if so, what does that look like, right? Yeah, and how do you do that? How do you get um, through that uh, bluster it, um, in a lot of cases, it's very difficult. You want to help small business owners. The great irony, and I know you uh, would would probably agree. Tell me if you don't. But I mean, the great irony is that the businesses we could help the most are usually the ones most resistant. Either no budget, not enough budget. They don't answer the questions that you need answered to diagnose problems and then come up with the solutions. So how do you dig through that? What do you guys do that works for you? Yeah, um, that's a, another good question. So I think there's a lot of just asking questions and actually getting to face to face with people. I think that's definitely, there is a lot of combing through and figuring out, you know, how, how do you best work with a freelancer um, or, and or what does a small business owner need? For, for me and for what we do, it's often in the form of, let's sit down and actually talk. Thank you for the lead form submission. Like our team scores it and we'll have a, a way of evaluating it to some okay. degree. Um, and that, I, I know, do that too, but I don't have like an official form. I uh -huh. just, I read it and just if the answers don't make any sense, then I just say, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm booked yep. up. I just don't need it. Yep. it no, it's a great, yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's absolutely to an extent what we do as well. There's different, there's some of those, uh, you know, some, some parts of that equation are a little bit more subjective, let's say, and, and some are more, you know, drop down fields that you tell us a budget or you tell us what you're interested in, that sort of thing. So there's definitely a bit of both. Um, but we get a lot of, of leads at Sears. So we do have a kind of uh, algorithmic thing built out internally to help us evaluate that, that sort of stuff, yeah. So do you believe that, I mean, as far as onboarding, well, first screening and then onboarding, um, is there like a, a, a process that you use? Is it multiple conversations over an extended period of time? Or is it usually um a one one conversation and then you know something yeah so typically 
at, at a high level, it works something like this. I'll pull the curtain back a little bit here. So at a high level, the way that SEER kind of approaches that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have a team of people dedicated to business development. Um, okay. and a large a large proportion of, of SEER uh, of our book of business is actually through referrals. Um, we really pride ourselves on the work that we do. And a lot of our business is built on doing good work and really sticking to that. And that, that has led to a lot of referrals. Um, so with that being said, it's, it's not a huge like external, we don't do a lot of outbound marketing is what I'm saying. We do some of it, we've started to do more of the last couple of years, um, but we don't do a ton of it. Um, having said that, we still get a lot of leads and they're the team, not me and my team. They actually will work through and vet that. They're the ones who actually own that algorithm I was mentioning earlier um, and will evaluate those leads coming in the door. Like I mentioned before, there's different, we have couple different forms, but they all kind of have some signals in them that will indicate at the very least budget, obviously for us, you know, dollars is, is obviously, you know, if you don't have budget, it, we can't really help you. Unfortunately, you know, we're business, right? Um, having said that beyond that, there are lots of other factors that may help us understand more value. Are you going to work with SEER for a very specific project or are you looking for us for, uh, as a partner? So that's another aspect of SEER. We are very much in the business of partnerships. We do not believe we're a vendor. Um, and we are very much trying to create both a relationship and success for you and your business. Um, so it's not that we wouldn't take on, you know, one-off projects we do from time to time, but generally speaking, we, we, we look to really create a partnership. We really care about our clients. Um, we care about our team and, and trying to bring those things together to create success essentially. Um, what would you say, um, from the perspective of the small business owner, what can they do to ensure greater ROI for what they do? And I'm not talking about the small business owner um, who basically has a hobby and will go to Wix or Weebly or Squarespace or whatever, where they're, they're trying to generate results using the free DIY template and they're not getting any traction, they don't know why. What could the small business owner in general terms do to generate more ROI, I mean, obviously, aside from working with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think at the base level, so this is something that I recommend to uh, a lot of smaller clients or, or, or uh, one-off or like uh, individuals um, that I may even, I actually do freelancing on the side as well. Um, and, and sometimes things don't work out there. But I think the number one thing I talk about is you should spend maybe 10 to 20% of your time on measuring stuff. Don't overthink it again. You can't, don't make it a priority. Um, if you're not investing lots of money and time into it. So you can't make measurement doesn't become, uh, doesn't return value until you have a certain level of, let's say, you know, throughput in your business, for instance. So let's just say you have, you know, a business that makes, I'm not sure, maybe maybe there's a thousand people that come to your website every month or something like that, or 2000, um, you're getting started out, which is great. You should focus on the basics. Like I mentioned earlier, don't, don't overcomplicate it, get your most important KPIs tracked, work to get those tracked. There's a vibrant community out there um, for things like Google Analytics and some of the other open source tools. Um, there's lots of resources out there. Um, that will help you understand how to track this one specific thing, if that's what you need. Um, but after that, I honestly, I tell people, you should spend your money, time and time elsewhere, growing your business acquisition um, and, and scaling and things like that. It just doesn't make sense um, to always spend time on measuring things right out of the gate. Now, obviously the caveat there is when you start spending money, it's very important to make sure that you have your measurement set up properly. So, Right. That's what I might say to a small business owner is it, it, it may make sense for you to spend X amount of dollars to make sure that you get your campaign tracking uh, pixels and Google analytics and things like that set up properly, because what you don't want to happen is for you to think you have set it up properly and then spend $10,000, $50,000 in ad spend to bring people to your website. Um, in you know whatever platform um, and find out that oh i didn't set this up right and all the data that i'm now getting 
isn't accurate. Right. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, we see that it's pretty common. Um, and we see clients make decisions based off that. So you're now you're now exponentially making that worse because you may be thinking something is working and it's not or vice versa. Why is that mistake so common? Um, I think because it, it, it involves a little bit of technical know-how and, and sometimes it, it can be uh, deceptive in terms of the data that you're seeing. Something may appear to show you that, oh, it's working. When in reality, so let me give you an example here. Um, it, it, it's fairly common for us to talk with a, a new client um, and, and we often, like I mentioned before, BD team will talk with them. And then after they evaluate it, a practitioner, someone like myself, um, may end up talking with the client. And something that we'll do beforehand is actually look out, look at their website and evaluate it briefly. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we commonly see people do is actually add, and I'm going to go back to Google Analytics here. We, we Again, we spend a lot of time in, in Google Analytics or GA. Um, so we, we often see folks put uh, the GA tag twice on their site. So what that means is you end up getting double all of your page views um, and it messes up a bunch of other metrics in there. Uh, and there's various ways that, that you can do this, but it's pretty common to put the Google Analytics code directly on your website. And then additionally in like, as you mentioned earlier, maybe like a WYSIWYG editor of some sort, there's like an integration with Google Analytics and you can drop the, the property ID in there. Mm, yeah. um, so if you were to do both those things, it, you, you end up with really messy data. Um, and unless you're actually, you know, someone who, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to debug something like that's very easy to see if you know what to look for. Right, right, right. And from the business owner perspective, you're looking at it and you're thinking, wow, all of a sudden I've got a million hits. Right. And you, no, you don't, it just looks that way. Um, right. So demystifying the whole process, what should small to medium business owners be focused on trying to measure when they're just out of the gate? I mean, just partnerships. I mean, I, I'll, I'll always go to non SEO related uh, topics when conversions are going to not really be relevant. What what should they start with when they're not at that point yet? Yeah, so again, I think I, I would go back to what I mentioned earlier and, and try to focus on you as the business owner, you know what are important signals to your business on your website, right? So, you know, a common, a common thought starter or question that we ask our clients is, tell me what a, a good user, quote unquote, looks like and tell me what a bad user looks like. Right. So, so a way to brainstorm this is just think about those two things and then think through like, what do both of those things, both of those people look and do on your website? Um, so there may be good things that you see, there may be bad things. And if you can start to walk down that path and walk through those shoes, you may come to a couple things that, that will help you understand, okay, I need to pay attention to time on site. I need to pay attention to just the pure amount of users I'm getting to land on this specific page. I need to pay attention to the, the, the amount of users that I'm getting to not only land on my site, but also get to, you know, two pages deep or three pages deep or something like that. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's probably a useful exercise to start understanding and thinking through the lens. Um, again, something that we work with on our team as you develop um, a measurement strategy is actually stepping through uh, being a user. So as we mentioned earlier, my team works with a lot of different clients across a lot of different industries. So one of the first things that we do in, in, in our pretty standard engagements is you know, develop a measurement strategy. And one of the first steps in that is actually spend, we spend an hour, two hours um, being a user on their site and, and trying to understand and actually literally step through. And we commonly ask our clients to, you know, is there a way that I can actually purchase X item on the site without paying for it? Or can I get a refund? Right. That's um, and that'll just help illuminate, you know, you'd be surprised how often we find that a key part of their site doesn't actually work or something like that. So suggest something like that as well. Beta testing. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's still the term used, um, but yeah, so many sites really, really need that. Um, what tools would you recommend outside of Google Analytics for measuring? Um, 
basically yeah. defining success and then measuring key performance indicators of the, that the company is achieving what they set out. Yeah, so on the topic of, I'm, I'm gonna answer that question, but on the topic of data users and, and, and actually stepping through, I actually had a thought that, uh, it actually does relate to, to your current question here, but um, something I think is, could be a useful tool um, if you're getting to that point where you, you, you do have a meaningful amount of traffic and are making or a really meaningful investment, um, something that's, that's really low cost, but I think has, can have really high impact, um, is doing some light user testing. Um, and there's some sites out there, usertesting.com, I believe is one that we've used in the past. Um, and it, it, it's quite literally just, you pay somebody to be a user and step through X process or do something on your site and they will give you direct feedback. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Sort of yeah. like a mechanical Turk almost. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Like mechanical <laughs> okay. be like I'm a real user instead of repeat this task a million times. Exactly. And probably a good way for freelancers to pick up some extra money as well. Yeah. 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 I'd agree with that. Um, but yeah. So you, that, that, that's, you were just asking, you know, what, what tools like that I think is a tool within your tool belt um, that, that could make sense. Again, that's, you know, you're trying to think through what, what problems am I causing my users or friction exists on my site and, Maybe we want to better understand my audience and how they interpret things. Um, audience research is another part of our SEO process at SEER. Um, that's a big thing that, that we also do as well. Um, and and it, you'll be surprised to, to often find things that you didn't necessarily ex expect from your users or the way they interpreted things. So we definitely find um, a lot of good information from doing interviews and, and user testing like that as well. Now, to what extent do you work or I should say SEER Interactive, to what extent do you work with SEO? So SEER was actually built on SEO. Um, our founder and CEO, uh, Will Reynolds, is a pretty renowned, I'm sure you probably would hate hearing you say that, he is extremely humble and super nice guy, um, but he's a, he's a renowned SEO. Um, he's traveled the globe, he's been doing SEO for since 2001-ish uh, era, something like that. Um, so a while now, and SEER actually started, our roots are in SEO, uh, and we grew from there. So we started as SEO agency, we still are today. So to answer your question, it represents a large portion of what we do, the biggest chunk of our business, frankly. It's your wheelhouse. Yep, yep, I would very much consider us uh, very top end of, of SEO. Um, we do that very, very well. So as you know, I mean, every what is it quarterly that Google comes up with um, a, a change uh, in their algorithm? How can small business owners on one side of the spectrum and the freelancers on the other side of the spectrum remain competitive with SEO and just try to achieve some, you know, competitive ranking mm -hmm. in Google search result pages or SERPs? What's the best way to do that? Is it content as king still? Or would you disagree? Yeah. So now you're getting into some very interesting territory. So I hope so. I'm doing my best. I want to make sure I ask you good questions. So uh, let me first start by saying I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an SEO. Okay. Okay. Um, I will say at a high level, at a very, you know, high in the sky level, like the, the general gist of it is focus on answering and facilitating your users' questions and needs, right? It should, anything that you're doing should stem from that. Their um, problems. And, yes, exactly. Okay. And, and case in point, measurement should never come before solving your users' needs. So what I mean by that is um, I've seen clients alter a user experience or change an experience or the way their site operates to be able to better measure and facilitate the measurement of something on their site. And we always caution and say, look, we can figure out the measurement. I would much rather have challenges and obstacles there and have a more uh, frictionless experience, so to speak. So um, on that note, it's, it's like you just mentioned, yes, solving your, your users' needs is exactly what you want to do. Um, as far as very tactical or more tactical things that you can actually apply and go do. Number one, I would say, um, yes, I still strongly believe that, that content is king. Um, and number two, I would say, as you mentioned, 
Google is a constantly changing thing, right? Um, so within that, there's a couple of things that you can take away. Number one, it, it, it probably doesn't make sense for the small business owner to pay, pay attention to every single algorithm update that comes out. But once or twice a year, there's some big ones that do come out that are important for you to pay attention to. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to say, go pay attention to this, this exact blog. I don't know any off the top of my head. Um, but there are a few that come out a year that you need to pay attention to is really what I'm getting at. There's a lot of minor, smaller changes that probably don't impact, um, you know, small businesses as much as they do larger, larger organizations, as long as you're not trying to game Google, because they will eventually figure it out in most cases. So, and you will get uh, penalized in some way, shape or form for that. Now, and I wanted to ask your, your input on something, because I did this maybe 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But I'll, this is a totally true story. I had a comp I had a business website when I was freelancing in between working at different agencies. And um, so I had that freelancing site. One day a competitor who I knew called me up and he said some expletives and basically how did you get to be number one in Google? And I said, well, I had no idea because it's too stressful to look at it every day. I don't check every day. I didn't know. How did you do it? And basically what I was doing was on a very regular basis, on a daily basis, changing that site around, that the first page of the site, blogging every day, changing the verbiage around, changing the links to try to find more authoritative um, sources and everything. And this was years and years ago when I was in Denver and really into it. Now I just don't care that much. So my question to you is, would that approach still work where you're changing the site, changing the verbiage, you know, tinkering with the alt tags and the links on a daily basis, basically, and blogging every day, writing about local concerns, so you can try to rank in local search results. Would that still work? Um, so I, I would say I would be cautious of editing your site super often. And the reason is that like, Google needs to learn and understand your site, right? Um, so it will come to your site and, and crawl it and then index it, right? That's how Google works. It comes to your site, figures out what's there, tries to understand it, and then will return it to users that are looking for something that hopefully is your site, right? Um, so changing things often means that Google may miss something. They may not understand something appropriately. They may misinterpret something, um, things like that. So I, I would be careful about changing things too quickly. I do think, I do believe and agree with the idea of of changing and testing and trying things out, absolutely. Um, but I wouldn't change it daily. I'm not sure that that weekly is is the right cadence. Maybe um, we're getting into some areas that I'm I'm less familiar with in terms of like changing your meta tags that often. The thing right. I would say, the thing I would say here is I, I do strongly believe and, and agree with you on is the uh, the the piece about blocking and, and developing content. That is absolutely important. We see that time and time again. Um, now it may be blogging, it may be adding articles, you know, however you want to depict it or expanding the, you know, the aspects of your site that you cover, um, however you want to depict it, but developing high quality content is important. And, and notice I didn't necessarily say long content. It can be short. I'm not saying the length here. I'm saying high quality is the importance answering your users questions um, and coming back to a little bit before that the question prior, um, I do want to call it, I think, a, a tactical tip here, something that, that uh, both uh, small business owners and freelancers and everyone in between um, can actually walk away with it and use is, as I mentioned, Google is a constantly evolving and changing thing, right? Um, so what you can do is go to Google and what we call it, we call this a, a do not hit enter trick or tip or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, Go to Google and type in the topic, keyword, query, et cetera, things that are relevant for your business and don't press enter. Look at what Google suggests to you, right? So if you type something in 
And if you see that there's lots of how to X, right? That's what Google starts recommending to you, you know, underneath of that. Um, you can pretty much assume that people are looking for education around a certain topic, right? Um, so that's one, one tactical tip, um, just the do not hit enter and see what Google suggests, right? Google spent billions, tens of billions of dollars, you know, in, in their auto. The right. auto suggest, I think it's called. Exactly. Yep. That's actually what I did because I, and, and, and I don't remember how long ago this was. I was in Denver, Colorado, and I was freelancing in between different agency gigs or while I was working at agencies and they didn't care. Um, and I wanted to pick up some more clients and I kept doing that. And I learned to use the SEO Denver, was it Denver WordPress website design? I did that and I kept Googling. Well, I was blogging daily about the challenges of working in that industry locally in Denver, the WordPress um, um, environment or whatever groups there were in Denver, whatever I could think of to write about so I could use Denver, Colorado, WordPress web design in unison. And after doing that for like a month or two, it just started going up in the search results. And of course, the minute I stopped doing that, it just just shot right back down. But it was good to see that it could happen. Um, it actually went past several very, very large, you know, downtown agencies in that area for several weeks. So it's not a real KPI to say, well, I'm getting a phone call or an email from somebody every 15 minutes. That's not a measurable KPI, but um, at least I don't think so anyway. But that approach did work. And so what you're saying is it's possible it could work, but a lot of it would depend on what city and state you're in and your demographics mm -hmm. and, and just your site in general, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Your site, I mean, the competition that you're facing, obviously, right? Right. Um, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, and, they, they were fierce competitors, yeah. And another thing on this front, too, um, on that, that do not hit enter trick, um, if you could take it a step further a little bit here, too, and, and press enter and, and look at what Google returns to you, right? So if they're returning a lot of video content, maybe you need to go create videos, right? If they're returning... If the first three results are Wikipedia, chances are you're, again, coming back to like an educational thing. Look at what Google's returning um, and, and try to analyze and try to think critically about what they're showing to the user. Again, because Google spent literal billions of dollars optimizing the search engine. So I, I feel good saying that if Google's returning to you things that um, are, are showing people how to do something, it's probably a good idea for you to, to think about educational content or how to how to do something like that. Um, now at SEER, we're, we're kind of we do that at scale and, and, and measure and actually scrape Google and, and then look at those things. And as far as like the not only, you know, does a does a map pack or local results show for, for what you're querying? Um, you know, what are the questions that people also ask? There's a PAA for short of people also ask at the bottom of a lot of common pages. That can help you understand, okay, this was the initial request or initial query that somebody was curious about. And then they often go here. So you can use that to kind of further drum up what, what content you should be going after. Again, based off of what um, Google is essentially recommending or saying that users are after this sort of content, that sort of thing. Okay. Where do you see the future of uh, measurement going? That I mean, Google's probably going to remain dominant for at least 10 years or so. It's hard to see Bing uh, suddenly becoming competitive. Yahoo takes a percentage of their search. I know that from Google. And Yahoo is basically what Verizon, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the, the, the future of measurement. Um, is in a very interesting question right now um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because there's a lot of um, things going on regulation wise. So if you live in California, you, you may be familiar with things like the California 
uh, Consumer Protection Act or CCPA. Um, in late 2018, there was a lot of going on in, in Europe related to the, the GDPR. Um, so there's a lot of actual regulations that are coming into and, and will be probably further progressed over the next five to 10 years. Um, and then along with that, the, the other aspect of it is uh, just the general security that the everyday user is more concerned about today more than ever. Um, and the implications that that has on measurement um, is that the, the world of cookies is, is really how a lot of analytics and, and Google Analytics and Adobe Analytics which are really the two <laughs> biggest players in the market right now. Bless um, you. Have been. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and have been for a little while now. That's what they operate on. Um, but the reality is cookies were never really intended to do all of the various functions, one of them being to track users on your website, track the actions that they do. Um, they were never intended to do that. Um, so a big theme here is really security and, and how that progresses over the next five years is a really interesting question. So to answer that, I think we're going to see essentially browsers and um, specific, you know, certain companies like Apple um, start to remove elements of being able to individually identify users. Um, so we're going to move towards a cookie list um, environment where modeling becomes a lot more normal. So estimating based off of the data that we do have um, to understand users and things like that. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I think oftentimes um, it doesn't, we often don't actually need to know uh, if this was, you know, an individual user, we don't need to know their name, phone number and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's just not, it's not helpful um, for a lot of use cases. It is absolutely in some, and don't get me wrong, there's reasons to have it, right? But if we're just talking about measurement of your website and the efficacy of content and, and your efforts from a marketing perspective, I don't need to know often at a one-to-one -one level, it's much, it's, it's, helpful, it can be helpful, and there's use cases for it, but um, just the aggregated understanding of, of where I'm putting my money and time is that returning to me. I don't need to know that at a one-to-one -one level. So I think that's where the future of measurement is, is headed. It's much more user-centric in a privacy-first way, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> does. Well, um, listen, I, I really, truly appreciate your time. Do you have any parting thoughts or um any information you'd like to impart before we tie things up? Um, I I would just say that uh, it's it's constantly an evolving world. I mean, just literally yesterday, Google actually introduced or reintroduced rather is, is really what happened, um, their next iteration of Google Analytics. So Google purchased a company about 15, 12 years ago, um, originally with a, a code base uh, that, that basically is what Google Analytics is today. Um, they've made some updates over the years, but this will be the first really big shift um, in, in terms of the way that we think about tracking. Um, so again, a, a big shift to, instead of thinking about things in terms of sessions or traffic, it's very much more focused about the user. Um, and, and it's called Google Analytics 4, the number four is previously called Google Analytics App Plus Web. Um, but it is a, basically a new, take on Google Analytics, so to speak. The underlying way that you measure things is, is very different, um, but the user interface looks similar and all that sorts of good stuff. So point being, um, I would think about how you're going to maybe make that switch if you're doing measurement today. Um, and if not, start with thinking about it from that perspective. If you can start there today, you don't have to relearn it over the course of the next 12 to 24 months when it, it absolutely will become the norm across the board. Um, so if Google Analytics is your jam, think about uh, what that future looks like. I, I might live into Google Analytics for today. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time, James. How can people uh, reach out to you to get in touch or find you online? Yeah, great. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter. That's at J-A-Y-C-O-H-H. That would be the best way to do it. Uh, or hit me up on LinkedIn. James Corr, as you mentioned earlier, C-O-R-R. Okay. Well, thanks again for your time and uh, stick around for another minute or two if you can. And for anyone out there watching or listening, thank you again 
for tuning in to Digital Marketing Solutions. I appreciate it. My name's David. You can find me online at dms.blue as well. And I forgot to add, if this podcast is helpful to you, please give it a thumbs up, especially on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks a lot and take care. You've been listening to the Digital Marketing Solutions Podcast. To get future episodes as soon as they drop, apply to be a guest, submit questions, or to get direct help with your digital marketing, visit www.dms.blue today. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give Digital Marketing Solutions a positive review or hit the subscribe button to be notified as soon as our next episode goes live. Thanks, and talk with you next episode.